Hi everyone, this is Mary Gannon with the Rhode Island Division of Fish and Wildlife, and welcome to our first lesson tutorial in the Feathered Friends Kit, part of the Rhodey Critter Kits program. So in this lesson we'll be talking about bird conservation history and how the story has changed for our wildlife over the course of America's history and what we've learned from uh, that story in terms of conservation today. So let's go way back in time uh, to early America where there was a lot of open space and an abundance of wildlife. And the Native Americans were obviously living here first and utilized wildlife resources for food, for shelter, for clothing, and they were utilizing habitat as well. There was some land clearing done uh, for both game uh, habitat, for driving game, and also for agriculture here in the Northeast. And this was a subsistence type hunting and trapping, right? People were only taking what they needed, hunting for their families, and um, utilizing wildlife in a way that was not depleting it heavily. Now when the Europeans got here, they were doing the same thing. They were subsistence hunting and trapping. However, there were markets back in Europe that they would send uh, pelts and, and, other, um, and other materials back to be sold in Europe because Europe had already depleted their wildlife resources. So when the Europeans got here, they saw all this open space the massive numbers of wild animals that were here and they thought, oh, this is endless. We can just continue um, to harvest this bounty here and not have to worry about the future. Uh, this is incorrect, right? Uh, so if we you know, hunt and trap and utilize land without thinking about the future uh, and how those, our actions are going to affect those populations and those habitats, that's going to have a negative impact on our wildlife and our habitats. So that's exactly what happened. We started seeing uh, animals disappearing uh, from uh, areas where they pre previously were abundant. Uh, so here in Rhode Island, believe it or not, it was hard to find deer and wild turkey at one point. Uh, the black bear was extirpated. Uh, we used to have wolves here, mountain lions. So all these animals disappeared. And over time, some of them have come back. Uh, such as deer and turkey. If you look out your window anywhere, you probably have seen them. Uh, but this was a big problem for, for our wildlife, this type of uh, unprecedented harvest and use of our wildlife resources. So we started to see things change a little bit. Now, if we fast forward uh, to the late 1800s and the early 1900s, we see a new level of wildlife resource use, and that's through um, the practice of market hunting. So market hunting is very different because it's not just hunting for you and your family to have something to eat. You're going out and harvesting a large number of animals uh, in a short period of time to sell at the market. Just like you would go and buy chicken at the supermarket today, you could go and buy uh, a wild duck at, at the market. Um, so this was a huge problem for our waterfowl populations and uh, all of these things hanging here on this boat, those are all ducks. Uh, same thing here. So obviously these pictures are upsetting uh, to, to see this, you know, oh my gosh, this is so much, <laughs> so much harvest and it's, it's uh, unethical. It's not, um, it's not sustainable. Uh, so with that, I, I say, you know, to, to teachers who are listening, you know, use your own judgment if you want to show these photos um, to your students. You know, younger students may not be able to handle it the same way as older students, uh, but it's important to see that, that this was a part of our history um, and this is what was happening. And as a result of this, we started seeing huge, huge declines uh, in waterfowl populations across America. So to put an end to this, the Lacey Act of 1900 was enacted and that prevented the sale of wildlife. Uh, so you couldn't barter, sell, uh, sell purchase wildlife. Um, so that put a stop to market hunting because you couldn't go out and hunt 50 to 100 ducks in a day and then go sell them at the market. You could only hunt what you needed for your family and then bring it home and, and consume it yourself. Unfortunately, birds are also being targeted for the hat trade and feathered hats have become extremely popular uh, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and uh, birds were killed solely for the use of their feathers and large numbers of birds were killed. Uh, a wide variety of species were harvested for, for this use and eventually people started seeing declines in many different species of birds, uh, including uh, our colonial nesting birds. Uh, so things like great egrets, which are here in the picture. Uh, you can see these long uh, breeding plumes here on the egret and here they are on the hat. And in order to put a stop to this senseless use of, of our bird resources, 
many women actually gathered together uh, to spread awareness and, and to do outreach about uh, the cruelty of, of feathered hats and what it was actually doing um, to our, our bird populations. Uh, so this uh, was the catalyst for the formation of many state Audubon societies, uh, believe it or not. And in 1918, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act was signed to put a stop to uh, market hunting and the hat trade. So this um, did not uh, allow people to possess feathers, uh, bird parts, nests, eggs. Uh, it prevented people from uh, harassing birds, killing birds, disturbing birds, moving nests. Uh, it, it, there's a whole laundry list of activities that is pre uh, prevent that are prevented by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. And uh, the, the act includes uh, Canada and Mexico now because our birds don't stay in one place. So birds in Rhode Island actually fly to Central America for uh, the winter. So it makes sense that all three countries in North America should uh, take care of um, should really take care of our birds that we share. Now there are some exceptions to this rule, uh, one being uh, hunting game species like ducks and turkey and grouse uh, during the um, hunting season. So it made sure that you had to set a season for those for um, harvesting those species. You could only take so many. Um, you could only uh, hunt during certain times of the year and, and using only certain methods. So it shrunk down um, how you could harvest uh, birds and, and how many were being harvested. So that gave birds the chance to bounce back from the hunting season. Um, another exception is for scientific research. So, you know, for me just being in my backyard, I can't catch a bird in net just, just for the fun of it. Uh, there has to be some sort of scientific purpose um, or, or uh, research being done so that you have to file a permit if you're going to be capturing birds and handling them. Uh, and the last um, exception is for Native American religious ceremonies. Uh, so uh, eagle feathers and, and other feathers as well are used um, in Native American uh, regalia and uh, religious practices. And today we keep an eye on uh, these birds, the ones that were especially targeted by the hat trade. It's very interesting to see uh, the difference now uh, from the uh, complete decimation of their populations to uh, uh, revival of these populations and uh, subsequent monitoring efforts. So each year uh, in Rhode Island, we go around to the Narragansett Bay Islands and where these birds nest. So we have uh, a great black-backed gull here and there's the little chick, very cute, uh, fuzzy little guys. Then uh, another colonial nesting bird, the glossy ibis. And there are the ibis chicks right there. And in these surveys, what we do is we get out on a boat. It's awesome. You get to see the bay and get to see these colonies up close and uh, do a general count of how many, uh, bird, how many nests we see, uh, how many birds we see, and uh, on each island keeping a record and seeing if there's a trend from year to year. Are the birds moving from one island to the other? Are there fewer of a particular species um, you know, than the previous years, uh, are there increases in, in these populations? And this is very important uh, to continue monitoring work uh, on birds because uh, with that data, the more data you can collect over time, the more you can detect trends in populations and then make decisions based on those trends. So if we see that things are starting to decline, uh, then maybe we need to protect more habitat or maybe we need to limit activities in a particular habitat uh, to give them some breathing space. Um, maybe there need to be, maybe there are environmental contaminants that need to be cleaned up in, in certain areas um, and the populations are reflecting that. Uh, so this, uh, this survey is fairly simple but gives us a lot of insight into um, how our colonial nesters are doing. Moving forward uh, a little bit in history, uh, we have the Duck Stamp Act that was following uh, the, in the footsteps of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Uh, so the Duck Stamp Act was signed in 1934 by President FDR, and the Duck Stamp, essentially what it does is that it makes hunters responsible for the game species that they are hunting. So if you are taking something out of the environment, you should be giving something back. That's kind of the, the idea of the Duck Stamp. So every single waterfowl hunter ages 16 and up has to purchase a uh, U.S. duck stamp in order to be, and also to get your hunting license, etc., uh, in order to be a duck hunter for the season. And additionally, we have state duck stamps. Um, here in Rhode Island, we have, you have to get your U.S. duck stamp and also your Rhode Island duck stamp. Uh, and 98 cents out of every dollar of the duck stamp 
goes into conserving wetland habitat as part of the National Wildlife Refuge complex across the country. And by protecting those wetlands, we are providing habitat for waterfowl, uh, but not just waterfowl, but also for anything that's living in that wetland. So this has been incredibly important uh, for bird conservation, but also for um, for other animals that utilize wetlands, which is really great uh, that we've been able to to do this uh, since 1934. The cool thing about um, the duck stamp I like to share uh, with with students is that um, it's an art contest every year uh, to to get your artwork put on the duck stamp. So uh, for the national one, it's it's for adults, but uh, for the state level uh, duck stamps, we have a junior duck stamp uh, competition, and um, we've had some amazing youth artists. Uh, pr provide us with artwork for the Rhode Island Duck Stamp uh, each year. And if you have any artist students uh, who are uh, wildlife lovers or, or want to get involved, uh, I highly encourage you to, uh, to check out um, the Rhode Island Duck Stamp competition uh, each year. And it's a great way to get involved and to learn about uh, waterfowl and, and also how uh, hunting plays a role in wildlife conservation. So nowadays we're tracking uh, our numbers of waterfowl so that we can make informed management decisions about harvest. So uh, here we have some pictures of our annual Canada goose banding project and Canada geese, believe it or not, actually can't fly for a period in the middle of the summer. So uh, they're molting their flight feathers, growing in new feathers, and you can herd them in kayaks uh, like a little herd of sheep and uh, get them into a pen and we handle them very briefly and give them what... Um, is here on this goose's leg is, a, is an aluminum band with an individual number. So if we recapture that goose next year, uh, we know exactly when it was banded, where it was banded, et cetera. Uh, the relative age of the bird when it was banded, uh, we say either it's a hatch year or an adult, um, and then we let it go. Um, so we've recaptured birds year after year. Uh, we can see um, where birds are going. Uh, so if that bird was harvested, the hunter has to turn in that band and um, and it's submitted into a database so we can kind of keep track of um, you know, which, which birds are being harvested, are they moving uh, from one state to another. Uh, we do this with wood ducks and American black ducks as well. Um, so that gives us a sense of you know, kind of the life history of these animals and how many birds are being harvested um, and, and how many birds are being recruited to the population. And all of that information, uh, fairly simple to collect, is crucial in determining our hunting season lengths, uh, the number of birds that you each individual hunter can take uh, in a season uh, and to possess um, you know, at home in the freezer, uh, that all of those management decisions are made based on data like this because we wanna make sure that we're not uh, overusing our wildlife, but we wanna make sure that we're not um, allowing populations to go unchecked. So things, you know, with waterfowl, with geese especially, uh, large populations can contribute to water quality issues um, with pollution from, uh, from feces. Uh, so, you know, thinking about keeping that nice balance of, of the population levels. We don't want to have no geese and we don't want to have uh, an outrageous abundance of geese. We want to have a nice balanced population that is uh, stable and sustainable uh, for years to come. And today, you know, it, we work with hunters to help our wildlife a lot. Uh, so following the Duck Stamp Act, uh, the Pittman-Robertson Act was also added in 1937. And that is how we do most of our conservation work today. Um, and that is, um, this funding is um, eligible for uh, birds and mammals. And the way that we get this funding is through the sale of firearms, ammunition, and archery equipment. So there's an excise tax placed on those items. So the manufacturers of uh, the, that equipment uh, they have to pay that tax, and that tax money goes to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who then turn around uh, that money and distribute it to the states. And then we have to use it for um, research and monitoring, for uh, conservation uh, of habitat, restoration of habitat, um, so we can acquire uh, new pieces of land uh, to add to our management area system uh, with that money. Uh, we've helped to fund uh, numerous graduate students at URI uh, with their research, their wildlife research uh, for their grad projects. Um, and then they turn around and they um, can share that data with us and, and, and their study with us so that we can use um, that information to make management decisions that benefit our wildlife. Uh, we use this for hunter education, uh, for outreach. Uh, so the critter kits, uh, all of our um, 
uh, our uh, resources that we give to the public, um, our, our outreach programs uh, are all free because of, of this uh, particular uh, piece of legislation, which is absolutely wonderful uh, that hunters are able to uh, give back that way. Again, user pay system. And uh, the nice thing about this is that also, if you're just a sports shooter, you're helping as well. So I don't hunt personally. I don't hunt, uh, but I do uh, like to target shoot uh, with archery. So when I bought my bow, uh, I was helping to contribute to uh, wildlife conservation right here in Rhode Island. Uh, so it's really uh, a rewarding way uh, for hunters to feel that they are uh, contributing and caring for the wildlife that they love so much um, and make sure that, they're, uh, that our wildlife are here for many years to come. So with that, that is lesson one, and let's move on to lesson two.